Hi everybody, I'm Brittany Lewis, a breaking news reporter here at Forbes. Joining me now is Washington Governor Jay Inslee. Governor, thank you so much for joining me today. You bet. Beautiful day out. It is a beautiful day out. I'm on the East Coast, you're on the West Coast from Sea to Shining Sea. It is a good day. Go. You and, you, and you are hosting Apex third senior officials meetings later this summer. So my first question for you is what do you wish to come out of these meetings? Well, you know, there's so much trade between my state. We have $110 billion of trade, $45 billion of exports out of our ports in the state of Washington. So this is very important to my state and obviously to the nation. And so, and it touches the fabric of everything we do from, uh, you know, aviation to software, to pharmaceuticals, to certainly agriculture. So it, it's sort of all encompassing. I guess in my, my standpoint, I would think the one thing that I would be most excited about is if we come away with a, a as much consensus we, as we can about how we're gonna build a clean energy economy uh, across the Pacific, we have tremendous growth going on in clean energy jobs in my state, and we want to continue to build those as rapidly as possible. We know climate change is eating us alive if we don't. And we want to do that that integrates our economies uh, in a way that, that helps everyone uh, both prosper and defeat climate change. And I think finding a way to do that is one of the more important things uh, for all economies today across the world. You know, today I was just reading an article about how the temperatures are becoming uninhabitable in parts of Asia. And at the same time, we have such tremendous growth. I got to, I was at the Paris Air Show last week and talked to some Washington companies that are developing whole new fuels that are clean and non-polluting. It's an exciting time on both sides of the Pacific. Where do you think the consensus is right now then on a clean energy economy? Are we figuratively worlds apart? Do you see us moving closer together? Where do we stand? Well, I think uh, there's several things uh, we've had success on. One, technological innovation is so it's so rapid right now. You know, the price of these technologies is coming down dramatically. Solar has come down 80% because of innovations on both sides of the Pacific. Uh, but we need to accelerate that. We need to find a way that economies can be in sync in our, in our anti-carbon pollution efforts. You know, there's, there's, uh, if, if the more we work together on this, the more equity will be of, on all sides of the Pacific, the more effective it, it will be. And the larger your anti-carbon pollution efforts are, the more successful they are. So right now we have a very effective, probably leading the nation in our, in our climate change policies in the United States. It's one of the reasons our economy is growing so fast. But the more that we sync it up with other areas, we're syncing up with California and Quebec in the near future, we hope, but we'd like to sync up our efforts internationally as well. So when you think about the, both the prospects for economic growth and the imperative uh, to prevent climate change from destroying our, <laughs> our homes as we know them, uh, syncing up our efforts, making them as ambitious as possible and as coordinated as possible I hope that this gets a really good discussion uh, started in Washington in a month or so. Sinking up these efforts sounds like a really lofty goal, but I do want to take a step back here and really look at the broader picture. So how would you currently characterize the relationship between the U.S. and the Asian Pacific region? Uh, like every human relationship, uh, beneficial and, and, and still having occasional tension. And we want that creative tension to, to create as much consensus as possible. You know, these relationships are always kind of two-sided. Um, we want to compete. Uh, competition is healthy. It drives more efficiency and growth. But we want to cooperate where each uh, area does what they do best the most. And so it's kind of an unusual kind of relationship, but one that has worked in the past. Certainly my state has prospered. It's one of the reasons we have been so productive and our economy has been so robust and uh, continues to experience really great job creation because we have found that this trade relationship is productive. You know, you grow and you can sell your products in more and more markets. And we have done that uh, across the Pacific. And, in a host of, of industries from aerospace to aviation uh, to software, uh, you name it. 
that's how you grow is by having more places to sell your product. So we look at trade in a positive way ultimately, uh, but we still think of it from a competitive standpoint. So it's one of those uh, interesting types of relationships, but if you do it right, your economy can grow and that's what we're doing. Before we look even more into the future, I do want to take a stroll down memory lane, if you will, and talk about your state specifically. Washington did ho host an APEC event on Blake Island back in 1993. So what has changed within the past three decades between then and now? Well, we, so much. I mean, technologically, you know, I wasn't carrying a, uh, I had a rotary foreign when I went to Blake Harbor on my senior cruise in 1969. When the group met in 93, I didn't have a cell phone. And uh, the technological change cannot be overstated. Obviously, the growth of some of our Pacific Islander, uh, our Pacific trading partners has been, both in population and economic growth has been incredible. You know, uh, uh, India is now the most uh, uh, populous country, the uh, largest democracy in the world. China's had spectacular economic growth. So we're, we're not as uh, dominant because we're not as singular, you know, back in, like I said, when I went to Blake Harbor in 1969, my senior cruise, we were like still one of the only healthy economies in the world. Now we're one of many. So that has changed. But what has not changed is our tremendous innovative capabilities, our technological creativity that still remains unsurpassed. And we need to find a way to maximize that opportunity, maximize the number of markets we can we can build in, and make sure we have supply chains that are healthy, that have uh, domestic content as well. So things have changed and things have remained the same. I do want to pick apart something you just said. You said not, we're not as dominant because we're not as singular. When Americans hear that, what should they feel? Should they feel scared about that? Well, I think we should feel confident, and I'll tell you why. I do think we have uh, the most innovative ecosystem for uh, entrepreneurship, uh, I believe, in the United States and my state, and nationally as well. We still are such a beacon of innovation. Young people still around the world want to come to the United States to pursue their, their technological and entrepreneurial dreams. I've seen that all over. You know, I was just talking to these folks making an aviation um, fuel the other day and see the spark in their eyes when they're creating a whole new business to be able to fuel airplanes with non-polluting jet fuel. And people come, kids come from all around the world because they understand this is the best place to, to build that kind of dream. We are, and I don't think that has been diminished in the United States and in my state particularly. And we ought to treasure that. We ought to be proud of it. And we ought to understand that, uh, you know, we're the, this is not the only place that has smart people in the world and that competition can be healthy at the same time. So I feel, uh, yes, there's more com competition, but there's more productivity going on uh, right now. Listen, I can't turn over a rock in my state without seeing a new business that's creating a new technology. I think some of the, uh, one of the visits they might have when some of these folks are with some of our advanced battery companies in our state. We have two silicon anode battery companies that are really leading the world. They're Moses Lake, Washington, relatively small town, 130 miles east of Seattle. We have a fuel cell, largest fuel cell, the largest truck in the world is powered by a hydrogen uh, fuel cell built in, in, uh, in Seattle, Washington. We're the largest manufacturer of, of polysilicate solar cells in the Western hemisphere. So we have a lot to be proud of, and we ought to, we ought to keep that in our, in our thoughts. What is Washington's relationship to Asia and the Pacific? Uh, what, what does that look like? Uh, growth opportunities. You know, I just, I just read this morning that India has removed some of tariffs on some of our agricultural products. We in our state have the highest value, or some of the highest value products. We sell kind of high on the food chain of food really high value. We add value to a lot of products. We have really high quality apples, really high quality wine. People love it. And we're continually opening up export markets in the agricultural economy. We're doing the same thing in entertainment and gaming. The gaming industry is enormous in the state of Washington. 
and and having that is obviously a large and growing international market. Pharmaceuticals, the same thing, and, and biologics that were were growing here. And as I've indicated, in clean energy, you just can't go anywhere in the world today that that has a more robust and diverse clean energy economy where we can sell our products around the world. Listen. The largest transition of the world economy is going to be taking place in the last, in the next few decades, since the development of the steam engine, and that is decarbonizing our economy. And this is an enormous economic opportunity for my state and our nation, because the world is going to be demanding these clean energy economies, and we are we've got a great start on that effort, but we need to continue to build these. Uh, entrepreneurial efforts so we can sell these products around the world because the world's going to be demanding them. We have no other choice. Survival depends on it. Failure is not an option here. And so this is a huge opportunity. We've got to find a way to maximize it, get access to those markets, and do what Yankees always do, which is sell our products overseas. Let's break that down a little further because you sound like you're really raising the alarm here. So how do we do that? How do we decarbonize our economy even further? Well, it's it's like most things. There's many many things we have we have to do. One, we need to give uh, support to some of our new businesses. We do that in in, in several ways in our state. Uh, indicated, uh, I was just talking to a company that's opening up a, a way to build hydrogen fueled airplanes using fuel cells, and they're opening up a, an operation here in my state. A company that's uh, building a, a whole new jet fuel way to make jet fuel using carbon dioxide and hydrogen perfectly clean, no pollution. We, we give small assistance to these startup companies to help them out. We give market signals, which we're doing through our Cap and Invest program, which is a market signal to give an advantage to clean technologies. We do some things that help these new technologies by requiring the development of new technologies. For instance, we've said we're not going to sell internal combustion engines after 2035. That is a huge <laughs> Obviously, incentive and tremendous uh, uh, help to the electric car and battery and electric charging industries to make sure they know they're going to have a market. Uh, then you have to then you do the old sort of shoe leather, which is you go around and help sell your products, which we do around the country or the world with our Department of Commerce. So we're doing those things. It's working big time and none too soon. We're in a race. We intend to win that race both to get market share of the new clean energy economy and to uh, uh, preserve uh, the planet, which is the only one we've got right now. Both are important. It sounds like you're saying Washington is leading the pack in this race, or at least is one of the front runners. So how do you get the rest of the nation on board? Well, the most powerful thing is an example. And I think Washington State is setting an example that you grow your economy by by fighting climate change, by creating clean energy businesses, and this grows your economy. It doesn't shrink it. We've demonstrated this big time. And I can certainly talk to any governor across the country and demonstrate in so many ways how we've been successful growing our economy by doing that. In fact, it's interesting, uh, former Governor Brown of California, uh, myself started uh, the U.S. Climate Alliance. It's now 25 states that have all uh, committed themselves to fighting climate change, building a clean energy economy. And those 25 states uh, significantly have greater economic growth than the 25 states that are not in that climate alliance. Those states are missing out a great growth opportunity. Now, some of them are getting growth even though they haven't asked for it. You know, we look at the uh, electric car manufacturing plants that are going into the Midwest right now. Uh, uh, and the, the politics of this is going to change when people start to see in these paychecks coming home because we're electrifying our transportation fleet. So this is growing. It's growing because of the clear example that you can create really good paying jobs by going down this route. And that's what really, uh, really pays off. But we're doing it internationally as well. We, we have an international alliance. Uh, uh, I'm going actually to another country here shortly to, to talk to other governors um, across the water. I can't announce where it is right now. It hasn't been announced yet. To talk to other governors in another Asian country about our success and hopes they can replicate it. So we, are, we have a good story to tell. 
I do want to talk about this year's APEC theme, which is creating a resilient and sustainable future for all. So can you elaborate a little bit on what that future looks like? Well, it's one where our kids have air to breathe, that uh, we don't have to keep them inside for weeks at a time like we did two summers ago because of the smoke from the Canadian fires that hit you know the East Coast this year. It's a place where they have snow on Mount Rainier. I'm looking at a Mount Rainier right now. And it's our tallest mountain. Half of the ice has disappeared just during my last during my lifetime in Mount Rainier off Mount Rainier. It's a future where our kids can go salmon fishing. And salmon are very much endangered by uh, uh, hotter temperatures, both in our rivers and in the North Pacific. We lost a quarter million salmon in the Columbia a couple of years ago because the water was too hot. It basically killed the salmon. So it's a, a life we want for our grandchildren like I grew up with. You can, you can breathe in the summer, you can fish in the summer, and in the winter you can ski. We want them to have that. And they're only gonna have that if we succeed in helping these businesses succeed in, a, in building a clean energy economy. And we want them to work in these areas too. And that's pretty exciting. You know, my neighbor's son, he always wonder what he's gonna do. Oh, he's working for an energy company now, developing uh, new energy sources. I see these stories all over of kids having new careers built in these, in these clean energy uh, uh, outfits. I remember I wrote a book a few years ago about clean energy, this vision. And a fellow came up to me and said, hey, I read your book. And I said, well, that was nice. And he said, yeah, I really, really read it. In fact, I quit my job the other day and I said, I'm going to work in clean energy. And I thought, well, that takes a little courage. <laughs> well, he's investing in companies down in California right now and apparently he's doing okay. So that's a future for our kids we want to see. I do want to talk about the future in 2024. You did announce that you weren't seeking re-election. So how do you envision the future without your leadership in Washington state amongst the Asian Pacific region? Well, I know we all think we're irreplaceable, but I haven't reached that conclusion quite yet. Uh, we're, there are a lot of leaders in this area and they're not all young. Uh, and, and it is growing. The support for this effort really is growing quite, quite rapidly. And it, it is doing that because of the success that we're experiencing economically. And also because people are now witnessing in their own lives, the devastation of climate change. So we have a lot of leadership in our state and in our nation. Everybody uh, on this call can be a leader themselves in so many different ways in their businesses and their families and how they vote. Votes, voting is important as well, of course. So I don't think we'll be lacking for leadership. And there's a lot of leadership around the world too. We're, you know, we're not alone on this. Uh, when I talk to people around the world, uh, the good news is we are not alone. There is such dedicated efforts going on. I was in Norway the other day and man, they're, they're selling electric cars like crazy. They're using hydropower. I, I just happened to be, I was out, we were going hiking and stumbled upon uh, one of the first hydrogen production plants in the world. It's in a fjord in Norway and they're producing hydrogen to run the cruise ships on, be the first cruise ships to run on hydrogen. So we're not alone in this. Uh, I believe we will succeed in this. I think it's our destiny to succeed in this and we're going to make some dollars at, uh, while we do it. So I'm upbeat about this. Governor, I do now want to turn the conversation a little bit to our relationship with one country in particular, and that's China. I had a conversation last week with North Dakota's governor, Doug Burgum, and he believes that we're in a cold war with China. Do you agree with his characterization? Well, you know, I don't go around looking to describe relationships as involving war. Uh, I'm not sure that really helps uh, the discussion. Clearly, China has exhibited some territorial interests that are not positive, I believe, for them or the rest of the world. And we have to make China uh, understand that those are not acceptable. And that is true. But I still believe we have a mutual interest with the people of China of developing these clean energy technologies so that all of our kids can live in a world where, where we can grow food. You know, I just read China is developing, uh, they're having some problems in their agriculture because of climate change. 
changing uh, water temperatures and the like, they're starting to experience this as well. So we have a mutuality of interest of finding a way simultaneously to push back against expansionist territorial ideas that some of their leadership may have, and at the same time, finding a way to maximize the growth of the clean energy economy. And we've got to find a way to do both of those at the same time, in my view. How do we find a way to talk with China? Just earlier this year, Ray Dalio said the United States is beyond the ability to talk with China. And just last week, President Biden characterized President Xi Jinping as a dictator. So A, do you agree with the dictator characterization? And B, how do we talk with China? I, I'm not going to stray into that semantic debate. Clearly, uh, uh, China does not exhibit the, 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 the democratic traditions that we have, and that's one of the reasons I like this country uh, so much. But sometimes you do have to talk to people that you don't agree with. There's no question. Some of those conversations are the most important. We ought to, in my view, uh, be willing to sit down to talk to, to people in China about how we succeed where, the, where our interests coincide. And I believe they do coincide in finding a way to build this clean energy economy. And it is important to do so. And we know we have to uh, build uh, more domestic uh, manufacturing capability uh, and not be so dependent on China. That's something we can do here that may not necessitate discussions with China. But to the extent they're helpful, I don't believe we should be afraid to have them. Governor, let's say you were in the room. What do you think is the most important conversation that the United States could have with China? Uh, well, at the moment, we just need them to, to find a way for China, if I can philosophize for a moment, to feel a, a greatness that doesn't involve territorial expansion. Uh, the, I'm, I'm hopeful that if we are resolute in our discussions with China, and I believe President Biden is and will be, I have a lot of confidence in his uh, diligence and resoluteness when it comes to this issue. He is not uh, withdrawing our, our passage through the straits of our naval vessels or our airplanes. And I think he's demonstrating a, resol a resolution on this subject. And I would hope that China recognizes that, that that is not something that is negotiable, but that China can find a way to feel greatness that doesn't involve territorial expansion. It's my hope that they will come to see economic expansion uh, as, as a way to feel proud and great. And if we do that, we'll, we'll, we'll all be doing better. But I think those are important discussions to make them know that uh, territorial expansion is not going to be successful for them. Governor, I do want to turn to you now. Like we said earlier in this conversation, you aren't seeking a fourth term, but you did run for president back in 2020. And I'm curious, can we expect you to run again in 2028? It'd be a good way to lose a bet if you bet that I'd be a presidential campaign <laughs> candidate. <laughs> So is your no, political I'm, career done after after 2024? No, no, I'm still in my mind. I I look in the mirror. I still look 25. You know, when I look in the mirror, I know I don't look that way to other people, but I got a lot of work ahead of me. I will be working uh, somehow in the development of a clean energy economy, and I'll try to find a way to be productive other than this particular role. It's something I believe very strongly about. And I understand that, that uh, you know, private enterprise is absolutely crucial to the success of this. These are good old business people who are developing these new technologies. If there's some way I can find a help out, I'll try to find a way. And as a politician, I know, I think I know the answer based on this conversation, but what is keeping you up at night? What is, do you think is the biggest issue facing Americans right now? Well, I've sort of tipped my hand during this conversation <laughs> on this subject. You know, there's just so many things that we face that are right in front of our nose, but there's this looming monster out there that that really uh, threatens our grandchildren and our great grandchildren. And it's something humans have never experienced before. It is so profound. Sometimes it's it's hard to even envision the changes that are coming. Uh, just the headline this morning, as I indicated, that said areas in you know Indian Pakistan are now becoming perhaps uninhabitable just because of temperature changes. 
the mass migrations that we are experiencing because of the desertification that's going on in the Horn of Africa, forcing people now to go across in these leaky boats by the hundreds. And we had hundreds of people drown the other day trying to cross the Mediterranean. We have climate refugees coming to this state from South and Central America big time. Uh, the changes are sort of sometimes beyond imagination. So there are a lot of problems to work on, but that's the one that if we are going to be remembered for anything two generations from now, I hope it'll be that we had the foresight and the gumption and the courage and the confidence to build clean energy businesses all over uh, this state and this nation and this world to solve this problem. And I believe we can do this. So Could I actually sleep pretty well. I'm a good sleeper. I don't lose a lot of sleep, but when I wake up, that's what I think about. Good, and how can we fix that right now then? If you, that's your biggest problem facing the nation, how do you fix it immediately? Uh, one step at a time. It's just like you climb Mount Everest, just one step at a time. You get up every day and you, you try to advance the cause. One of the things we did recently is to have a building code rule that will make sure people get a heat pump uh, when they build a new house or a business starting uh, next year so they don't have to hook up dirty gas. Uh, it used to be called natural gas. It's really dirty gas. You put, you put gas in your home and in your stove, you're 13% more likelihood that your kids are going to have asthma because of the benzene's cancer-causing material that comes out of your stovetop. So we're trying to uh, help people get cleaner sources of, of energy and heat and cooling in their homes. It's one small thing but you just gotta take one step at a time. And uh, we're moving the needle on that. One step at a time, we will leave it there. Governor Inslee, I appreciate you coming on. You bet, good luck.